The following interview was conducted with Professor uh, Thomas Carney, Professor of Aviation Technology and former head for the Free University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, September the 14th, 2009, at his office in, um, at the terminal. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Good afternoon, Dr. Carney, Good and this is part two, so we'll continue with what we're talking about. Um, I think we're going to, uh, for the researchers, we're going to talk a little bit initially about Purdue Aeronautics, which was a corporation that used to be here, housed at the airport. Sure. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I came as a student in 1967, Purdue Aeronautics Corporation was still in operation, and uh, the aircraft that they had were uh, DC-3s. I believe there were four DC-3s and probably two or three DC-6 airplanes, uh, at least two of which, I guess, were MPATI, or Midwest Program for Airborne Television Incorporated Airplanes. And so, as a young student, that was a, that was a real draw for all of us, because those were airliners and we wanted to fly them. And, I can remember sitting in the Aviation Technology Building, now Nicewanger Hall, in the in a one classroom in particular with a DC-3 taking off on runway 5 and coming right by the window. And so loud you couldn't hear yourself think and talk about a motivating factor. But we had, uh, we had classes on DC-3 and DC-6 systems and operations. The uh, C-8 link trainers that we had to fly as upper division students were were made to fly sort of like a DC-3, albeit with one throttle, not two, but we made it work. And then uh, United Airlines had donated a DC-6 simulator, and so that was really the start of the large-scale simulation in this department. And that was really the start, I think, of, of really our nationally recognized excellence was because we were the first probably to have an airline class simulator even if it was an older one. And uh, Good enough. So it was in the Aero building, Hangar 2, and uh, you know that was a part of it. And the, the uh, Purdue Aeronautics Corporation crews that flew the DC-6 did their training over there when the students weren't flying that simulator. And so uh, that was a very good thing. And then in about 1969, uh, there, was a, there was a change, and, and I don't know exactly why the change was, other than uh, Purdue, Aer Purdue Aer Aeronautics Corporation being Purdue-owned could not make a profit. And somewhere along the way, they felt that if they were going to advance, they were going to have to make a profit, and they, they wanted to get into jet airplanes. And uh, that's when the jets were really coming the four, the 707, the DC-9, and, and others. And <clears throat> so in order to do that, they incorporated, and Purdue Aeronautics Corporation, I guess that was incorporated as well, but there's a separate corporation called PAI, or Purdue Airlines Incorporated. And Purdue Airlines Incorporated was, uh, was owned by, primarily owned by two brothers by the name of Stevens in uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, Purdue had a seat on the board and Professor Maris, they may have had more than one, but I'm reasonably sure that Professor Maris as the department head brought forth the educational needs we still had for Purdue Airlines to provide. And uh, in that way they could make a profit. And so they bought two DC-9-30 airplanes. They leased one from Hughes Air West airline. And along the way, they also operated uh, a DC-9, a black painted DC-9 for Hugh Hefner called the Big Bunny. And it was operated, uh, it wasn't here a whole lot, but when it was maintained, it was maintained here. And it was flown by cockpit crews who also flew the rest of the Purdue Airlines airplanes. And I can remember at least one occasion, late at night, it must have been 2 o'clock in the morning, and we were bringing a group of skiers back to Chicago, as I recall, from Denver. And they were delayed because of a blizzard up in the mountains. And so the captain said to the crew, let's go get some dinner. And so he took us all out to dinner, and then we went back to the airplane, and they got there 
somewhere around midnight, I suppose, and they carried the walking wounded on first. I can remember people in on crutches and that kind of thing being carried onto the airplane. And somewhere about two in the morning, over Montana, the air traffic controller and they, you know, it was pretty well known that Hugh Hefner's airplane was operated by Purdue Airlines. And he was kind of silent on the radio, and, and so he called the Purdue flight number, and he said, uh, say the color of the airplane. And uh, I think the first officer was the non-flying -pilot, uh, pilot, and he said, it's uh, blue and white. And uh, the controller said, Roger. And then there was another long pause, and he said, do you guys ever fly that black airplane? And so I think the captain, whose name was Dusty Burke, I'll never forget, picked up the microphone and he said, yeah, we do. And, of course, the controller wanted all kinds of stories. And it's, they, Really, the crews didn't like to fly it all that well because I think there was some harsh taskmaster-type things that they, they really didn't want to do all that much. But uh, So those things took over, and in... And, and, as a, as a senior in 1970, 1971, my classmates and I flew as student second officers on the blue and white airplanes. We didn't fly on the black airplane. And uh, our systems training moved to the jet, moved to the DC-9. So I would leave, as my classmates did, I'd pack every white shirt that I had and all the socks that I had and, and uh, because I didn't know when I was coming back. I might be gone a day, I might be gone a week. And um, in my bag, I would also have a DC-9 manual that was about six inches thick, and I would study, keep up on my studies while I was on the road. And so that happened during that period, and, and in, on April the 1st in 1971, the airline ceased operations. And we really never knew why. Hmm. And it wasn't until probably 20 years later that I was talking with Bill Duncan and it was then the department head and I was his assistant department head and I don't know how it came up but he said well the reason that the airline ceased operations was that one of the brothers who had controlling interest uh, was going through a divorce and had to divest himself and liquefy most of his assets because the court was going to order a, a split and so when he had to liquefy his his part of Purdue Airlines Incorporated, that shut the airplane and the airline down. And so, a really unique experience. I would say so, very much so. And got all the personal touches, which is really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was really it was really something. And in the, the part of the terminal building where we're now sitting, and on west was where the airline operations were. And so, as a student, I walked by the office I'm now occupying, never knowing that I'd be here, uh, to the big open area at the end of the hallway, and that was flight operations. And so one of, one of my classmates, one of our class, had to be at that operations, unless we were all in class 24 hours, seven days a week. So we might go, I've had, I had times when I would go to school all day, work all night, go home and take a shower and shave and probably either go back to class or pack a bag and go on an airliner and be gone. Wow. Big, heavy, thick schedule. Yeah. Just like really manuals. It really was. <laughs> uh, okay, then well, on the post 9-11, the impact on the department, students, etc. You made some comments. Yes, it was, well, it was, it was devastating and, and of course like it was for our, all Americans, it was both devastating and I think we didn't have any idea how devastating it would turn out to be and how impactive it would be for our economy, for our industry, all of those things. The immediate impact was, uh, well, the absolutely immediate impact for me is that I was going to be taking our, our jet to Washington National uh, with one of our vice presidents that day and I was supposed to leave about 11.30. So and normally I would have left about 6.30 and I would have probably been landing at Washington National about the time the airplane hit the Pentagon. As it turned out, I was home getting ready when the first airplane hit the World Trade Center. Um, and uh, came to work and, and of course not only did I not fly the trip but 
all airplane, all civilian aircraft traffic was uh, grounded. And uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we only had one airplane of our training fleet that wasn't where it could be here and hangared where it was supposed to be. There was one student that was on a cross country and landed at Kokomo. And it was probably a week or a week and a half before we could get the airplane and bring it home. But uh, we had, uh, at, at the day before that, we had a situation where we couldn't produce enough graduates, flight graduates. And not only could we not, but all of the collegiate aviation programs in the country didn't have enough output to really meet the hiring demand of the airlines. And on that day, and then for 18 to 24 months after that, the hiring stopped. And we had uh, interns that were sent home. We had interns that were on their way to an airline and were told to turn around and go home. And the reason was that the, the FAA, the FBI, the federal government said to the airlines, you're going to have to totally vet, re-certify re everybody that works for you, everybody that's in your, your control centers, in your cockpits, in your airplanes. And they, had, they, they couldn't have students there. They didn't have time for them. Uh, <clears throat> and um, with the impact on ridership and that kind of thing, there wasn't any hiring. And they, they really couldn't have processed them anyway because they were busy revetting all the people that, <laughs> that worked for them. Board, right. right. Yeah. So it was really a, <clears throat> a very disruptive time and a very, uh, very negative time. But, but we have, uh, I have a dear professional friend who has been a long-term member of our industry advisory committee, and he's uh, he's a retired Delta captain, and he's revered throughout collegiate aviation because he's done so much with uh, all of our collegiate programs, or many of them. You couldn't do it with all of them, and and he's endeared himself to students, and he's mentored students. He's really quite a guy, and I remember him talking to our students and saying. Uh, you know, I, I, I hear, I, I've hear, heard a story that, that there's, there are no jobs and who knows who's going to hire when, and, and he went on and on with this doom and gloom, and the students are kind of saying, yeah, you know. He said, you know when I heard that? And he heard it like 20 years ago, and he said, then I heard it again 10 years ago. And he said, sure, we've come through a terrible thing. But he said, we're going to have air travel. And we've, we've gone through down times before, sure. and it will come back. He was the only one that really forecast it to be in a timely way, and he hit it pretty well, about 18 months. Mm -hmm. And what's happened since is that there's been this cyclical thing. It happens just about on the zero or one years, so it's about a 10-year cycle that the airlines are down, the economy's down. And the airline is, is kind of like the parakeet in the mine, or air travel. When the economy gets down, people don't fly, and businesses don't fly, and so there was that effect. But we've we bounced back. What we teach certainly has changed a little bit, anyway. Uh, the need for safety and security uh, for those of us who are flight instructors, we now have to every year go through recurrent training for safety and security. Uh, and the, the department is responsible for knowing that we have, uh, for having certification that we have, for our large simulators and for our jet aircraft by, because of the size of aircraft, the weight, gross weight of the aircraft. Uh, it has to be a U.S. citizen or the person has to be specifically approved by the TSA and or the uh, Attorney General's office. Uh, originally it was Attorney General's office. so. So in essence, we have to have all of our students have a passport. We have to have a record of the passport. When I go back for annual training, I've gone there for the last 20, almost 25 years. And yet, I still have to take a passport, and they still make a copy of my passport every year. What is the impact uh, with all the mergers with the airlines? There's not as, nowhere near as many as there used to be. That can impact on employment and the whole it does. It does. Um, 
worldwide, you know, there's actually growth, and worldwide, there's a shortage. I, I chair a task force at the uh, International Civil Aviation Organization that's looking at the next generation of aviation professionals, and there's a growing concern about a shortage worldwide. Now, here in this country, we have pilots furloughed, but if you look at yeah. India, China, and the others, they're growing in such a way that for a person that wants to go international, there's a job, and there will be a job for the foreseeable future. Um, it's always been cyclical. It always will be. What the airlines in this country have done, not a, they, there has been some mergers. You know, Northwest and Delta have merged. Uh, and there has been some, uh, where there was a duplication of effort, there have been people who have let go. Mm -hmm. But um, as much as anything, too, most airlines have, have decreased their capacity right now right. because an airline sees this commodity and you waste it if it goes empty. And it's expensive to put in the air. So that's really the things that have happened. Right. And, and the enrollment or the placement for your job, for the students down is, is, down, is up. It's back up. Right. It's, okay. it's um, well, it's back up some. It's sure. not nearly like right. what we want. Right. Uh, after, after the 9 11 issue and after that 18 month or so period, then we were back to uh, regional airlines hiring more than we could output, and the students getting jobs before they had their degree in hand. And that went until um, a year ago in April. And all of a sudden, it stopped um, because the economy tanked. And that, that decrease in capacity, so it's back to being kind of gloom and doom for a little while. But that'll change too. Sure, sure. Okay. sounds good. Um, this partnership, we talked a little bit off camera or off recorder. She talked about airlines, and you had a little story you were going to share with Chautauqua. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've, we've had a great relationship with Chautauqua. And it still operates, though, doesn't yes. it? Yes. Okay. In fact, it's a, an extremely large and successful company, and it's getting larger by, not by the day, but it's getting larger over time. And being an Indianapolis-based corporation and, and with uh, some of our graduates having positions there, so few and fairly key positions, and they respect our graduates, our product, and like it, and you know it's just a win-win as an in-state company with a state institution. So we have had an ongoing wonderful relationship, and that continues. The story that I was going to relate to you is that I was in... Uh, Montreal in May for this task force. Uh, actually, it was a, what it resulted in the task force. And on the way back on a Friday evening, I was uh, <clears throat> on a regional airliner and I walked in with my carry on and I, and I said to the flight attendant, um, Should I go ahead and red tag this and leave it at the jetway because I'm not sure it'll fit in the overhead? And she said, Oh, it'll fit. She says, as a matter of fact, you can put it right up here. And I looked at it, and it was in the first class section. It was really designed for a crew bag. And I said, well, that's great. You really think it'll fit? And she kind of rolled her eyes, and she said, you know, I do this for a living. <laughs> so she jammed it in there and shut the door, and she said, of course it'll fit. <laughs> kind of gave me a hard time, and I laughed. I said, well, thank you very much. So I went back in the back, and when we got up to cruise, the airplane leveled off, and I think she'd even served the drink service that she was going to do. We were going to go to Washington, Dulles. And she came back and she said, um, why did you tell me you were from Purdue? And Because I had my crew, I have a crew tag on my bag. It says, because I'm a crew member on our corporate airplanes, it says flight safety crew and it has my business card on the back. And she said, why did you tell me you were a Purdue professor? If I didn't know that, I'd put you in first class. There was room up there. And I just laughed. I said, well, that's very kind of you, but I, I didn't think to ask. And she said, you know, we have a lot of your pilots, and we really like them. And so we had a nice chat. But, but one of the neat things about my career and those of my colleagues who have been here so long and the heritage we have in aviation education is that 
when I get in an airplane, and Jim Maris used to say the same thing. You know, you listen to who is the flight crew, and I've I don't do it much anymore until I'm getting off of the airplane because of safety and security concerns. But I'll leave my business card and just ask the flight attendant, "Would you give that to the first officer or to the captain?" Because you recognize the name. It's one of my students. Super, you know, That's and nice. uh, and uh, or to walk through a terminal. And you'll see, I'll see one of my kids. I call them my kids, you know. My wife enjoys that, but she gives me a hard time about that. Or on the frequency, because our tail numbers end in Papa Uniform or PU. Not many people want a tail number that ends that way. And so it's pretty obvious to everybody on the frequency that's a Purdue aircraft. And pretty well everybody knows that those are turbine, our turbine airplanes. And it's quite frequently the case that when you check on somebody, will say, go Purdue. Or somebody will say, you know, who's the captain? I've even had controllers say, you know, who's the captain? That's uh, it's like when you're you're out, and somebody that you may have had in class, tw some fifteen or, you're only one of, of many, but they remember you, yeah. and it's hard for you have it's just hard to yeah. even if you have pictures and and people change over time, yeah. you know. Uh, so and and that makes it all even more rewarding. That's the true reward, and that really is, you know, it really is that. Keeping in touch and recognize just a little brief chit chat. I go for that. Right. You bet. Yeah. Um, the brief air, air mechanics, the um, United Airlines maintenance that existed at one time in Indianapolis. If you just right. make a kind, what uh, any kind of liaison with the university when that. Right. When when United Airlines was looking to, what they wanted to develop. Was about a, three years ago, maybe. Oh no no no! It's wrong. been a long time. It's ago. Been Bill a Duncan long was department head. It oh. was probably. Um, Ten maybe. Oh, it's got to be more than that oh, okay. because my crews and I did it together once. He did five, I did six, so twelve. It's probably been fourteen or fifteen oh, years okay. ago. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. And uh, so United Airlines wanted to develop a large maintenance base somewhere for the Boeing Boeing seven thirty seven airplanes that they operated, and Indianapolis was in the running, and they promised to bring lots of jobs and a tax base and all those things that governments want but they wanted concessions and they wanted certain things. And one of the things that they wanted was uh, an outstanding aviation degree granting program close by. And so they, uh, the state, when, when they were putting together the package, contacted our department and said, you know, we want you to be a part of this. Can you be, will you be? And of course we said yes. And uh, I think that was a key piece of getting that facility in, in Indianapolis. Oh, sure. And they want uh, education. Right. That's key. And that resulted in, though it was manifest in a statewide location because technology, the College of Technology, of course, has a statewide technology program. And <coughs> the we could say, if you'll build us a building, We'll put a statewide aviation technology program right next door to that maintenance space. And we weren't the only one. Vincent University was in there and is in there still. Indiana State University had a, a presence in there. They don't have much there now. But uh, that was part of the draw. Uh, they really didn't bring in the numbers of students that we thought they would. And they really didn't bring in the numbers of people that even they thought they would. And it wasn't all that long until fortunes changed and, and they actually withdrew or uh, vacated that facility. And there's another company now called AAR there that does aircraft, large heavy aircraft maintenance there. Um, we still have, I think, a relationship with AAR. They, I think there are still some AAR people that are seeking a degree slowly but surely with us and probably also with Vincennes okay. because they can do that. But it's were there many were there many students that signed up? Did you have some students though? There students? were some, but there weren't a lot. Okay. Not not anything like we thought there would be. Right. What about the other the Vincennes? Were there, did they get some students? They got some, but I don't think they got anything like they thought either. Right. The whole thing just and just changed over time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, it, they have a new. The, uh, let's talk a little bit about the 50th anniversary in 2004. Yeah, that was, 
that'll be a wonderful memory out of a out of a cornucopia of wonderful memories. But as the department head, it fell to me to bring that together with a lot of good people helping. And we it's ended a up. Team. It was a team effort, you big time. And uh, we ended up uh, having a, a long weekend. Started, I guess, on a Thursday, and then we had events on Friday, culminating in a major. We had a big open house all day Saturday, and we had people from the community as well as graduates come back. I wanted to have something in excess of a thousand at the banquet. I think we had just over 400. We we had enough to fill the north ballroom, and we had the south ballroom for reception, and then the north ballroom for. Um, the celebration, and it was uh, I deemed a few spoke. I had a few words. Uh, one of the one of the most memorable parts of the evening for me personally was to present an award to Professor Maris, a plaque to honor him as the as the genius that formed us and, and the hard worker that made all this come to pass. He's considered the founding head. Of the he was. He was. In fact, when he came. He put together an aviation program, it was an aviation mechanics school, I believe, in the Division of Technical Institutes. So our department was one of the form, forming initial departments when the School of Technology was formed. And uh, Jim Maris, you know, was the guy with a, with a small but good faculty that made that happen. And so it meant a great deal to me yeah. to be able to honor him in that way. And, uh, and to him as well. Well, I hope so. Yeah. And uh, but it was something that was something that desperately needed to be done, and I wanted to be sure that it did. Sure. And to have over four hundred people giving the standing ovation was pretty special. That'd be icing on the cake. Oh yeah. And uh, of course, he spoke eloquently, and I think it, it really got to him and, and to Lucille and to Vicky, who were our collaborators in making it happen. Uh, also, we had. Uh, we had Raul Cabeza, who was one of the captains for uh, Purdue Air and Ice Corporation and then Purdue Airlines International, who was uh, who went with most of the flight crews to Southwest Airlines. Uh, he's now passed away, but he was there, um, and others that are real pioneers. Uh, Captain Cabeza and, and uh, Emilio Salazar were two that came from Cuba. Uh, they flew for Cabana Airlines. I recognize that name because Jay Golden I addressed and made some comments, so as you're saying it, I remember him speaking that. Right, and uh, they were able to escape, I think, communist Cuba, come to the United States and, and fly here. And so it was great to see him back and others uh, that had so much to do to make this a success. It was a great celebration. Uh, and it was really kind of the start of the process, I think, for what has now crystallized into a new building. Right. Um, hey, Mike, that's a good lead into it. I was going to have a couple of comments about that. Sure. Scott Neiswanger, uh, who's such a magnificent benefactor for us, uh, was there, and Scott announced, he asked, he asked for a moment from the podium, and he announced that he was starting a, an endowment and invited other people to give to it to honor Charlie Holloman because all of us revere Charlie as our advisor and our mentor. And uh, so that started a scholarship in Charlie's name. And then, I guess he, Scott had already, had already given the money for the simulator facility because that was dedicated when Mike Cruz was department head. So Scott had already been a great benefactor. And then I think, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how it all began to develop, but we had been talking about a new building for, since 1989. And uh, as a matter of fact, I just pulled the 1989 academic uh, program statement for our current department head who wants to know, are we missing anything? You know, do we need anything else? And uh, in 1989, what we put together, I think they priced it $30 million in 1989. Well, if you figure that what we've got is just under $7 million, that was going to be kind of a, it was going to put every bit of the department under one roof. All the aircraft storage and maintenance and all the labs and all the faculty and staff offices and the classrooms, everything. And there would be no land 
left, I don't think, unless it would be just east of the rocket lab, Chafee Hall. I don't think there's any, there's enough land this side of the railroad track. Did you? Yeah. So the ideas have changed. They've, they've <coughs> updated, they've developed, but what we've got now is really pretty special. But that was the beginning, and you have to start. It's a good start. Right. Yeah, all right. What about uh, diversity in, in uh, your department? That changed? We've got, we've come a long ways, we've got a <coughs> long ways to go. Uh, historically, the aviation industry has been a male-dominated industry, but we've made great strides over the last two decades, I would say. And by we, I mean everybody that's a part of it. Uh, when I first started flying airplanes, it was extremely ra rare to hear a woman's voice on the radio. And Joe McCormick, who was one of our very first faculty members, had been a WASP in World War II. And she's a hero in her own right. And had she lived 50 years later, she'd have been an airline captain. But in those days, she, she could train them, she could teach them, but she couldn't go be a woman, which is a terrible travesty. But she was good-hearted about it. She, you know, she liked what you have to like what you were doing, and she understood. Yeah, she understood. Yeah. But, right. but uh, she educated us, you know, and and uh, got us on our way. And she gave, I think she gave me personally, with some other people, Charlie and others, gave me a foundation that in instrument flying that has served me well for over four decades, and I can't thank her enough. And she kind of adopted my wife and I when. When I uh, had my first job for Purdue, teaching in her position for a semester, and we became really close friends. And uh, so, Jill was the first and the only for a long, long, long time. But in the last, as I say, 20 years, we began to make inroads, and now it's fairly common to hear a woman's voice on one or both sides on the same conversation of the radio. So the FAA has made huge inroads in having women become controllers. Uh, airlines have made huge inroads in hiring women to be uh, cockpit crew members, the military. You can now be a military pilot, and you can now fight in a fighter. You can be in combat. That's right. But we've still got a long ways to go. Uh, in our department, probably, it's still about uh, 25 to 30 percent women and uh, far less than that of uh, underrepresented groups otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so we have a concerted effort to at every opportunity to grow the diversity. And I was just at a, at a um, search and screen workshop this morning on campus all morning. And uh, you know, it's obviously and appropriately so a, a really strong imperative for all of us to do what we can to grow diversity. So we're getting there, right. but slow. Yeah. It takes, it's an ongoing thing and it takes yeah. lots of slow moves and little things like that that work. It's we working. have to contact girls when they're younger to say, you know, it's okay to have a technology career. Right, exactly, right. In uh, June of 2005, the airport was added to the list of historical sites. And for the researchers, make a couple of comments on that. Sure. What? Was that that entail? It was a lot of work that went into that. Yeah. I, uh, well, we had uh, Don Petron on our faculty did uh, the lion's share of that by far, and Marty Clem helped him with that. Um, I think we had colleagues. Uh, I'm trying to think whom. Probably Tom Ferris and some groups from Aero and Astro, uh, and we had a, a grand celebration on a hot June Saturday. But uh, we opened up the hangar where Amelia Earhart's airplane was outfitted and. Uh, we reflected on the history there, and Bob Stroud, who was uh, emeritus, I think he has the emeritus title, he was our former mm -hmm. retired uh, airport director and who knew Bill Fledermeyer, and, and uh, a lot of the people that I've talked about, uh, Rob's a dear friend, and, and Bob spoke eloquently about the history of the airport, how it came to be. I learned a lot myself about the fact we, that it was a transportation You came from research. a lot of these people that uh, have a lot to contribute. That's what this program helps out. Exactly. That, uh, it just enriches the university. Right. Yeah. The, I, I just really never realized that the degree to which 
David Ross had in mind this was a transportation research facility and we were still researching steam train uh, steam locomotives or diesel locomotives right and that the the uh, piece of iron that was always the backstop for the best parking spaces for the department was a piece of railroad tie that was a part of that but I didn't know that until that <laughs> that dedication but it was a grand day and it was a, a wonderful uh, thing to do to recognize that that facility that's housed us for so long been our home and um, Matt Johnson who's our our senior technician in that part and our building deputy and I looked at the, the plaque and we knew that we had the vision of, of a new building and we thought you know where do we put this because if we don't put it in the right place and even if we do it may have to move and so Matt being the creative guy that he is he and I looked at a low he said I think we ought to put it here and I'm gonna put it in such a way that it's secure but I know how to get it off and so if we needed to get it off when the new building came about so that it wasn't buried we could do it without damaging it or frankly the building behind it very badly so probably until now only Matt and I knew that story probably but that's where we put it so it would be easily seen by everybody that goes into that part of it it'd still be visible with the new building or we'd move it so it was sounds good yeah good choice <laughs> <laughs> oh. were you ever a um, faculty fellow no and I uh, but you're aware of the program I though. am yeah. and, I, and, and I even had an offer that, that I didn't avail myself of just this fall <clears throat> maybe one of these days I will it's just been so busy yeah it's a nice program but I think <coughs> it, one of the changes has been with the consolidation and the new centers the food centers the dying facility that have opened it's not in the same building and sometimes it's kind of hard to get together yeah. with the people and yeah. I think and I've talked to some people we we go to Tarkington but we haven't gone very much because it's not Wiley is about the closest and parking is a little bit of a problem so but it, it still is a good program sure. there uh, let's talk about some of your awards. Um, you are in the inaugural group, the Purdue University Book of Great Teachers. Yeah. Which is very nice. Thank you. And you got the William A. Wheatley Award sponsored by United Airlines. Right. Were you a little surprised when that, uh, sometimes I yeah, ask I people that. I was. Yeah. Uh, it's, and it's a great honor. I, um, you know, I keep talking about Professor Maris, but he's such a hero to me and a mentor. Right. And Professor Maris got that award a long, long time ago. He was one of the first. That's nice. Yeah. And you got the President's Award from the University Aviation Association. Uh -huh. That's very yeah. good. That's that a nice great honor. Be, yeah, it's nice to be surprised, I think. Um, are you still, are you on the Board of Trustees of the University Aviation Association? Are you still on that? Or no, any other uh, I, I did uh, at two different times. I did two three-year tours of that. Uh -huh. And then I'm, I'm serving my, I guess my fourth consecutive three-year tour for the uh, Aviation Accreditation Board International. I serve that group as president, so I'm president of the board. Okay. And uh, I'm on my second year of a two-year term. In that organization, you serve two years as vice president, and then it's envisioned that you're in training to be president for two years, and then you're the immediate past sure. president for two years, so that there's a six-year commitment, but there's that uh, connectivity. Yeah, it's like you mentioned earlier, and I was gonna ask you, your industrial advisory committee, um, what do they have? Do they serve for a certain term, or and how has it been well, for some time? I think probably that our new department head will probably uh, formalize that a little more than we have. In, in the past, people served as long as they were active and wanted to be on and in good, right. uh, good standing. And so we've had a number of people. We've had a number of people that have, have cycled through, and they've said, you know, I've, it's been great to do that, but. It's probably time to, to cycle off, and we've honored that. We've had a few people. I mentioned one, uh, Frank Main, just a little bit ago, the Delta captain, former Delta captain, that uh, Frank's been with us for years and years and years, and he keeps coming back, and we keep learning from him. So It's nice. Uh, with my oral history advisory committee, I have a couple of new people this year, but they've been on since we got started, and it, I just don't have it that structured, and it sure. seems to work out. Sure. I mean, if you 
don't want you, just let me know. I think they know me better yeah. than that. <laughs> right. How about a uh, Purdue tradition? Do you have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share oh, with us? Oh, absolutely. Good. Uh, probably the, the, the biggest tradition for our family is uh, the Christmas show. Uh, when I, I don't know if I told you earlier, but, but I married my high school sweetheart, and she still is, and best friend. And uh, we dated for three and a half years, and we've been married soon to be 39. No, soon to be 40. We passed 39. <laughs> you and Jack Benny, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, but but uh, we were dating when I was a, an undergraduate student at Purdue, and we started probably my freshman year Going in 1967. Through. Her family and my family, they came up, brought her, and uh, we went to the Christmas show, and then we started going every year. And the only years that we missed were when, our, when we started our family. We were married 10 years before we started a family. And then probably there were four or five years that we didn't go because the kids were so small. We just didn't, didn't want to leave them in a babysitter, and we didn't think they'd enjoy it or sit through it. And I started back, as a matter of fact. I said, well, let's try. I'll get two tickets. And I took our oldest daughter, who's now expecting our first grandchild. But she was probably five, and we tried sitting down, but she, she was a little fussy, and so we just went out and enjoyed the singing from the lobby and talked to people that I knew that were ushers, you know. But other than that, my wife and I have gone, and our, when our kids were old enough to go, that's been a tradition. That's we always nice. go. I was going to ask you about family. So you were talking about children. How many children do you have? We have three daughters. Okay. All three Good. are married. We have three wonderful sons-in-law. Did are like your sons children sons. go to Purdue? All three daughters went. Okay. Neither of the uh, none of the. Well, excuse me. Uh, our son-in-law that's married to our oldest daughter has a PhD from Purdue. He did. He he's originally from Albania. Uh, he did his uh, baccalaureate and master's degree at the Sorbonne in Paris, and then he came over here to get his PhD. Met my daughter. And uh, so they're married, and so all three girls went through. Okay, where do they live, and what do they work? Do any of them live here? Uh, our oldest daughter and son-in-law, the one with a doctorate, uh, he's looking for a tenure-track position. What did he get his PhD in? Uh, in uh, philosophy. And he also has a strength in political science. And ironically, um, he got it a year ago, it should be two years ago this coming December. And. Uh, it's a real tough time in philosophy to get a tenure track position. So last year, all of last year, he had he had two visiting professorships, one in Pennsylvania in the fall and one in Maine in the spring. But those were just a one semester appointment. And he's but been it's working hard. Anyway. Oh yeah. yeah right. But ironically, he speaks and reads five languages. And in the professor visiting professorships he got were in French. And he taught French. And he now is hoping that uh, he'll be called to be a teacher with the State Department to teach diplomats, U.S. diplomats French, and uh, be in the Washington area. So they're still here, but they're keeping their fingers crossed. Oh. They want to go to Arlington. Um, our middle daughter went through aviation management, and she works for United Airlines in management in Chicago. And uh, she and her husband live north of O'Hare. And uh, her husband uh, is an ex-Marine and uh, is a professional in uh, professional uh, security with a very well-known major personal security firm. So when they travel, she's got her own built-in bodyguard. And that makes her dad very happy. Because <laughs> they like to go to international locations, and I just feel better. Seth is with her. And then our youngest daughter and son-in-law uh, are at Fort Rucker, and he's active duty Army. He's a controller with the Army at Fort Rucker. And, uh, is he career? Is he in the career Army? He yeah. is. Okay. Uh, and I, he's, he's really done well. I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't stay in 20 years. Uh, we'll see. Well, that sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Um, how about an outstanding event? Yeah, you can have I tell people you have more than one. Oh my goodness! There's been there have been so many. Uh, let me divide it into into family, 
and professional. I, I, and, and there have been so many, we could spend the rest of the week, eight hours a day. It's been quite a ride, but, but family first, uh, just having, having the, the real blessing of marrying your best friend and a, and a wonderful marriage, a wonderful set of kids, now six from three, but, but I, I suppose walking my daughters down the aisle, uh, we've been a, a members of our church since we got married. I was still an undergrad, and our, the minister that married us in Indianapolis said, oh, you need to see Dr. Kruger at Emmanuel Church here, United Church of Christ, and we've been there ever since. Well, it's got one of the longest aisles in the Lafayette area. It's gorgeous, and it's got a big stained glass window built around a stone cross that when the light comes through, it's just unbelievably gorgeous. And so as, I, as the girls were growing up on Sunday mornings, I dream of walking them down the aisle, and I've now done that. And each girl, each daughter, picked out a song that they knew would be special to me that was special to them for the dance, the first dance with Dad. Uh, I love big band, uh, um, and especially uh, Glenn Miller. And so our, our middle daughter was married first, and she chose uh, Moonlight Serenade. Glenn Miller. Glenn Miller. And uh, then our middle daughter knew that I liked uh, uh, Louis Armstrong's uh, It's a Wonderful World. And so we danced to that. She, that was the oldest daughter. She got married second. And then our youngest daughter picked out a song that I'm not all that much into country music anymore, but so I never heard it, but it was called I Loved Her First. And I almost get tears in my eyes when I even say it. <laughs> As we danced to that, there were people all over the place, you know, with tears running down their eyes. It was, it was pretty incredible. Very, very special. Very special, very. with a plethora of special things. Right. And you can see in my office what my family means to me from the pictures. Uh, the stuff, the, the can of cross stitch that the oldest daughter made related to aviation. Uh, and then I suppose, you know, career wise, and I, I don't remember from our first conversation, but I suppose it comes down to uh, Dr. Beering and Mrs. Beering and the relationship that I had with them and that the other captains that flew them and the people that they brought in and since then you know I've had the I've had the rare privilege of flying with every at least once every Purdue president since Dr. Hubby including Dr. Hubby and uh, everyone and they've all been special and, and unique in their own right and uh, so my career became beyond description. Uh, it was so much fun to come to work, and it was because of Dr. Beering and what he did. It really was uh, pretty special. And I, you know, I, I may have mentioned to you. I wrote down a list because I thought I'd forget. I've had the privilege not only of all those presidents, but the Dalai Lama, Jimmy Carter, Neil Armstrong, Gene Cernan, Tim Russert, Andrew Card, Bob Dole, Tony Morrison. Uh, deans, provosts, coaches, faculty and staff, uh, prospective athletes, uh, people that are major sports figures now that they were a kid standing there next to their parents and it's 6 o'clock in the morning and it's still dark on a Sunday mor or Saturday morning and here I am picking them up to take them to a football game. That's pretty special. It is. And has great, it's great memories and just makes it, it makes your day. It's fun. Any closing comments? That, uh, anything special you want to do? Say? Have we covered it? You know, I think you, you've done a magnificent job of, of asking all the right questions, and I really am honored to have the opportunity to talk with you, so thank you. I thank you, Dr. Kern. Thank you very much. It